time now for Perspective and a recent discovery that challenges long-held beliefs about human evolution. Researchers here in France have uncovered a child's tooth and stone tools dating back some 54,000 years. The discovery in a cave in the Rhone Valley suggests that modern humans arrived in Europe from Africa about 10,000 years earlier than previously thought. It also appears to indicate that they didn't immediately wipe out Neanderthals and that the two species may have coexisted for some time. Well, to get our teeth into what it all means, let's speak with Professor Chris Stringer, anthropologist at the Natural History Museum in London and co-director of the Pathways to Ancient Britain project. Professor, tell us what exactly was discovered in this cave and why it's so significant. Well, yes, yeah, so this site's been under excavation by a French-led team for some 30 years. Uh, and, and in recent years, they discovered uh, a long sequence of Neanderthal stone tools and some teeth, which we can assign to Neanderthals by their size and shape. But in the middle of the sequence, there's a quite distinct stone tool industry called the Neronian with tiny little points, which look like maybe very small spear points or just as likely actually the heads of arrows. Um, so this is a distinct in the middle of the sequence and in there was one child's tooth and we've been able to identify that tooth as a modern human child. So there's this occupation in the middle of a long Neanderthal sequence, an interruption with a distinct stone tool industry and a modern human associated with it. So we can date this level to about 54,000 years. And so we have an extraordinary story from Mondrian, the first time we've been able to document this kind of sequence. First of all, Neanderthals are there for probably 20,000 years, a brief appearance of modern humans, the Neanderthals then come back, and then finally modern humans are back there again about 42,000 years ago, and then they stay. And why is it so significant, Professor? Does it literally rewrite the history books when it comes to human evolution? Yes, it does, for, certainly for, for Europe as a whole, um, because what we thought before was that modern humans came in you know, between 40 and 45,000 years ago, and then within a few thousand years, the Neanderthals had disappeared. We think they died out physically by 40,000 years ago. Now we reset the clock by about 10,000 years for this very unusual appearance of modern humans at about 54,000 in the Rhone Valley. And so this suggests that you know, we've got only a very partial story, that actually there may be more discoveries like the Grot Mondrian one to come, and that modern humans were probably making a number of, let's say, dispersals into Europe, into Neanderthal territories, but at this early stage, they weren't able to establish themselves. So we have a period of ebbing and flowing of these modern and Neanderthal populations until finally the Neanderthals do physically disappear, uh, but it takes a lot longer than we thought. And in a sense, this puts Europe into line with some of the other parts of the world because we think that modern humans got over to China and towards Australia uh, by 50 or 60,000 years, perhaps older. And so Europe seemed to be a, an unusual situation where modern humans weren't able to penetrate. We thought Neanderthals were somehow keeping them out, perhaps. Now it looks like Europe fits a little bit better with the story we have from the rest of the world of early dispersals of modern humans, but ones which you could say ultimately were at least temporarily unsuccessful. And the cave, it also provides the first clear example of a site that was alternately occupied by Neanderthals and then Homo sapiens. How do we know this and how did the two species effectively live together during that time period? Well, there's certainly a lot we still don't know about this now because this is such a, an extraordinary and a new discovery. But it does seem that the appearance of modern humans at the site is very rapid. There's a very rapid transition from the Neanderthal occupation to the modern human occupation with these Neronian stone tools. Modern humans are not there for long. It could be centuries, it might be a little bit longer, but it's not a long occupation. Then there's a gap where there seems to be no one at the site. The site is effectively abandoned by humans for a period of time. Perhaps the climate was too severe and the modern humans disappeared, but even the Neanderthals don't come back straight away. There's a gap and then the Neanderthals are back. So we don't know how much these populations coexisted. There seems to be no sign of influence in the Neuronian of, of let's say, Neanderthal behaviour. It seems to be quite distinct. Um, afterwards, perhaps there was some influence on, on the Neanderthals, and that's something which people can now look at because, of course, there are examples of uh, changes in Neanderthal behaviour after 54,000 years ago. And 
we can now say possibly there was some influence, possibly there was contact. We know interbreeding happened in other regions between the Neanderthals and early modern humans. Perhaps it happened in, in, in this area as well, but we don't have evidence for it at the moment. And Professor, it was previously thought that the Neanderthals were quite rapidly wiped out, so to speak, by modern humans, but that doesn't appear to have been the case according to this study. Why did we previously think that that was what had happened? Well, I think looking more widely, we knew there was a broad coexistence of modern humans and Neanderthals for perhaps 20,000 years. We think modern humans made a major dispersal from Africa about 60,000 years ago. So that's 20,000 years before the Neanderthals disappeared. So in areas of Asia, for example, Western Asia, we thought there was some kind of coexistence. But in Europe, it seemed that that came much later, that it was an appearance of modern humans from about 45,000 years ago, and then the Neanderthals disappeared, um, you know, within a few thousand years. But now we can, as I say, put the clock back 10,000 years, even in the European story, and we see this much broader phase of comings and goings of these populations. Um, at times, modern humans were dominant, and at times, the Neanderthals were dominant, until finally they physically disappear uh, at about 40,000 years ago. But of course, not completely disappear, because most of us today have a little bit of Neanderthal DNA, including me, certainly, from interbreeding that happened before the Neanderthals disappeared. And just briefly, Professor, and finally, what difference does all of this make to us now, knowing that this might have been what happened 50,000 years ago? Well, I think it shows the vulnerability of human populations, that uh, those modern humans were there. They seemed to have uh, very effective technology, quite an advanced technology, and yet it wasn't enough to keep them there. They, they still disappeared from the region completely. Um, and so it shows the vulnerability of humans in the past. And of course, it means that even today, you know, we shouldn't assume that uh, with all our technology, we will always survive. We will remain here forever. Uh, extinction is the fate of, of most, by far the most of the species we see in the fossil record. And for modern humans, we don't know how long we're going to be around for. So there are lessons to be learned. Um, just before you go, Professor, could you tell us just how exactly this cave was discovered? Was there anything else found there that was of interest to the archaeologists? Yes, so the cave has been known for a long time and there are a series of sites in the Middle Rhone Valley which have this unusual industry called the Neuronium. Uh, unfortunately, many of those sites were dug out um, a long time ago without systematic excavation. So uh, Ludovic, the leader of this project, was able to concentrate on Mondran and really with careful work over, as I say, some 30 years, he has... Uh, pioneered this site as an important site. He's championed it and he's worked there very carefully. And so, uh, you know, we owe him a great debt for his persistence in believing in this site and what it will tell us about human evolution. Rewriting the history books, as you say. Professor Chris Stringer, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you.